week four of prepping data was a wee bit tricky if you attempted it prior to the 30th of January and didn't have that respondent ID. It made our pivots go a bit funny if you didn't have that and it was definitely causing me some pulling out my hair frustration. But luckily that's fixed and so I'll give you now the solution to this updated version. Uh, most of the steps are still the same. It's just that now I'm getting closer to the results that Carl has in the output data. So if we come to the solution here, then it starts off with inputting some data about the survey responses and then a mapping table of the question number and what the question actually is. That joins together quite nicely. Uh, there was no cleaning required at this stage, which is always good. Now we're just doing some nice grouping um, of the countries. That was quite a nice um, animation actually to show the grouping that happened. Whoop. Um, sorry. So what I usually do if I know that I've got a clean um, uh, text field like this is I'll just play around with the grouping ones because I think it's a really cool functionality in Tableau Prep. It's actually one of my favourite things if I'm doing Tableau Prep versus Ultrix is this grouping. Um, so I'll just play around with the pronunciation, the common characters and the spelling, because you can always see um, what is being included in that group and manually adjust it if you don't agree. So you can see that these um, Eglin things are being grouped together. I think this one's by the pronunciation, so you can see why they're being combined. And I just find that logic really interesting. So just played around with the country there. And then the store, uh, the only reason that I knew that Amsterdam and Amstelveen had to be the same was because I peeked at the output data that we were trying to get to. Um, and to group those ones, I did a manual selection because I couldn't see how Tablet Prep was going to know otherwise, really. Uh, or I could have written a calculated field, obviously, but I didn't. So now, uh, one of the things that we need to do, or that's vital to this challenge, is we want to know when customers are first responding to the survey, when their latest response is as well. So we need each of these questions that they've answered to have a timestamp against them, basically. But at the moment, it's just in a separate row, whereas to have the information, it would need to be in the same row because um, that's kind of how uh, Tableau Prep is working, you know, on a row by row basis. Um, so we want to pivot these questions basically to be separate fields. So this is the bit, if you tried it before the 30th of January, that would get a bit funky, but now it's okay because we have a row ID in there or a response number. That's the that's the one that's helping us in this instance to maintain the correct level of detail. So we're just doing a rows to column pivot with our questions and taking the min of the answer. And that gives us our nice uh, 28 rows of data. So we know that 28 is the number that we're looking for, because if we look at our response, then 28 is the highest number there. So we know that we've got 28 different responses. So in our pivot data, we would want 28 rows. So then we're doing a bit of date time cleaning now. Uh, I decided because if we look at the dates, um, where is it? So what day did you fill in? Then you can see that we've got a lot of, so this is, you know, day, month, year. Um, if we go down a bit, then we've got year, month, day. We've got all kinds of different logics going on. We've got some, you know, Jan in here as well. It's all a bit, um, it's all a bit messy, really. And if you think about writing a long if statement that's going to deal with all these different types of um, dates, it starts to give you a bit of a headache just thinking about it. So what I decided to do is just duplicate the column of what day and just try changing it to the date because I'm lazy and I thought I'd see how Tableau would deal with it. And it's done pretty well, actually. Like, I personally went through and checked each of the rows because there's only 28 rows. Um, but you can see how well it's done. And there's only one null here. So we can see that the null is um, to do with this Monday, the 13th Jan. And I think that the reason Tableau is struggling with this is because it doesn't have a date, like a year there, sorry. So it doesn't have the 2020. So we're just going to write a manual calculation to help it out there. Uh, so we're saying that for any value that's null, uh, which in this case is only one, and we know how to fix it. We're going to make a date where the year is 2020, 
Um, I'm going to do some date passing here. If you're not familiar with date passing, it's just kind of pen and tablet. I know that the format is like this and help me turn it into a date. So that's we're changing that Jan so that MMM, which is a capital M's for the month, because we know that's the J-A-N. Um, and we're using a bit of regex to tell which bit of that string we're looking at. In this case, we're looking for um, a capital letter and two smaller letters or so, sorry, more than one lowercase letters. And that's going to make that into a date. So to have like a default year and a default um, day. So we want just the month of that. <laughs> That's a little bit complicated, but hopefully that made sense. And then for the day, we're just looking for um, some digits and taking those integers to make a date out of it. Otherwise, our date is just going to be whatever is already in that column. And then we're taking away the unnecessary fields. So that's how we get our date. There's probably much cleaner ways to do that, but I've had, I had quite a lot of fun playing around with it. And for time, we're doing quite a similar thing where we're duplicating it um, and we're using a calculate. Oh, this is a bit different, actually. Sorry, we're duplicating the field. And then when I was playing around with just turning it straight into a time, I was finding that if it had a full stop instead of a colon between the numbers, then that was an issue. It didn't like that. Um, so I decided to say that if it's containing a dot or even a colon, then replace the dot with a colon. So that's kind of one structure of the time in this case. Uh, otherwise, all the other versions were sort of two numbers, like the hour, hour, and the minute, minute, right next to each other, not separated by a comma or a dot or a colon or anything useful like that. So I was just using um, some string logic to say, uh, take the left two, stick a colon in the middle, and then take the right two characters. So then that leaves us with this lovely mess, which is still pretty gross. It's got AMs in it and PMs um, and all sorts of nastiness, but it's clean enough now that when you change the type to a date time, Tableau knows exactly what to do with that um, and how to turn it into a time. So easy and kind of fun to play with, I think. And then we're just getting rid of unnecessary fields. And finally, just creating our completion date by using a make date time of the date and then using um, date parts to split out the hours, the minutes and the seconds, which is nice and easy. And again, removing unnecessary fields. Another requirement is to make an age. So we've got our date of birth and we know that we wanted to calculate uh, the age at the 22nd of um, January 2020. So we're just doing a date difference between those two dates. I always struggle to know which way round it should go. Um, so I always look at the example to see what it's going to do. So in this case, it's doing a minus three. So we've got sort of the later month ahead of the earlier month. It's giving us a minus there. So um, in this case, I'm putting the earlier month before the later month, uh, the later date, and therefore it gives us a positive number because you want your age to be positive, if that makes sense. So uh, that's all nice. We're getting there. We're cleaning it all up. And at this stage, I've also duplicated the completion date, but I'll come back to why I've done that in a second. So now we're doing the more interesting bit of this challenge, the analysis bit. So we want to get our first response for everyone, for the name, store, and country. So we just need to have a min of the uh, completion date here, and I've just renamed it to be first response. And then we'll join that back with our date, with our uh, data here, and we'll lose eight rows because there are eight instances of duplication, or eight instances where someone has completed the survey more than once which is what we were expecting. We knew from the description of the challenge that people will have completed it more than once. So when it comes to latest response, we then don't want any of these to be the same as the first response because some people will only have completed the survey once. So in this case, we need to know the first response and the latest response. Um, 
So we're calculating that here and we're getting the same 20 rows. That makes sense. So we're just going to filter that out now. So where the first response is not equal to the latest response, those are the rows we want to keep because we only want those where, yeah, the latest response isn't the same as the first. And again, we're joining that back on to filter out those rows from our main data as well. And we've got seven additional rows. In these cleaning steps, uh, this one here and this one here, we're just adding on a, a result field, which says either latest or first, and then we're union, unioning those back together. So that means we're just stacking those results back on top of each other to get 27 rows. And if we're wondering whether that's the right number, then I kind of came all the way back to my survey data. Um, and I'm just going to insert a branch here. So we know that we had 28 response values. Um, oh, yeah, is this a good place to do it? Yes. No, this is not a good place to do it. I would come to once we've pivoted it. There you go. That's a better place to do it from. So let's just look at our people um, in this case. So we've lost one person, which suggests that one person has filled it out three times. They've had a first response, a latest response, and then we would have lost one in the middle where um, it wasn't the min date, it wasn't the max date, it was one in the middle. So we can see here that Juliana has three rows and therefore 27 makes sense as our number of rows at this stage. If you follow that logic. Uh, now what we're doing is calculating the MPS, the net promoter score, um, we're just saying, you know, if it's less than seven, detractor, if it's less than nine, passive, otherwise it's you're a promoter. And that kind of gives us, if you can see down here, I'm not sure why tablet prep is having a bit of fizzy bit up here, but down here you can see that we've got that all uh, in one column. The output is actually as separate columns with ones and zeros in. Uh, I noticed in the output we don't include the date of birth anymore, so that's why I'm just using as a count. So we get our ones and zeros in the uh, promote, net promoter score. And then all that's left to do there is just reshuffle the columns to check with the output, which doesn't match exactly at the moment, but I think that will be updated at some point. Hopefully that all made sense, and please let me know if you have any questions.